today. <laughs> Go ahead, Sini. <laughs> thank you so much, Annie, and thank you for Dr. Stoking for spending an hour on this Friday afternoon with us. I'm so happy to see you. You're so busy. You're very difficult to get into. <laughs> But uh, I just want to share a very brief story about Dr. Stoking. It uh, goes back 13 years when she came to the veterinary specialty hospital. We had a, a dachshund, a smooth coated Jenna, Jennifer Haynes. Somebody check your phone on. <laughs> anyway, um, she, uh, hello? Oh, good. I was just. Could everybody be uh, listening to that uh, thing on dermatology, but they haven't even started talking yet? <laughs> so, yeah. hold, hold on. I'm trying to mute um, participants. So hang on. Yeah. Hang on one second. Let me go ahead and I'm going to go through and mute. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. go ahead. I'm so sorry, Sini. <laughs> sorry to group for that interruption. I see our board vice president, Howard Finkelstein, and co founder on the call. Thank you, Howard, for joining us today. So, Hi. I took little Coco into Dr. Stoking, and actually I didn't, my husband did. And when we got done with our appointment, uh, my husband said to Dr. Stoking, I have a terrible skin problem. Could I please come to you? Because Dr. <laughs> Stoking solved the problem that no other dermatologist could, and we were able to take care of Coco's problems through her whole life. So it was my great honor to welcome Dr. Stoking and to thank her for with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. Stokey. Oh, you are so welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Yeah. Dr. Stokey, you're going to go ahead and um, do the um, okay. share screen. Okay, webinar. Slideshow from the beginning. All right, now I have lost the ability to share the screen. Let's see. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to try it now. Okay. Host disabled participant screen sharing? No. Let me go back. And, okay, hold on one second. I'm so sorry, folks. Let me go ahead and we're going to go back really quick. And if you want to go ahead and just, yeah, if you want to go ahead and just start talking a little bit, Dr. Stoking, and let me, um, let me do something with the video, okay? Okay. All right. Well, first of all, today was a busy work day, so I share an office, so I am wearing a mask because of, obviously, COVID. my little dog is behind me kind of taking a nap, but he might poke his little head out, and he is a very allergic dog and had a little problem with his eye, so he's wearing a cone of shame. He's a Westie, so it's a tartan cone of shame. Um, basically, as you'll see, the title of the presentation is Veterinary Dermatology, the Best Job Ever. And that is because it truly is the best job in, the best specialization in veterinary medicine. Um, my patients are not permitted to die. That's a rule, so when anyone <laughs> signs up to one of my patients, that's an absolute rule. Um, and unlike people that do ER or surgery, we don't necessarily fix all the problems in one visit. The derm problems are chronic, but the good thing about that is that I get to form really close bonds with my patients and with their families, and I find that incredibly rewarding. That's one of the things that I love the best about what I do. So the other thing about DERM is that it's not small animal or large animal or exotic. It's basically all of the above. And although most of what I see uh, is small animals, it's mostly dogs and cats, I also get to work with horses. And every now and then, 
lions and rhinos, well, not so much lions anymore. I did in Illinois, but um, uh, rhinos and um, some exotic species that not everyone gets to work with. So it, it winds up being very fun. Um, so should I share, try sharing yet, Annie, or not? Yeah, go ahead and try to share now, but let me, if it's still not working, let me, um, oh, it's still not. let me see what I'm it's doing, still. okay? Okay. So the other thing that is interesting about dermatology is that the skin only has a few ways of showing abnormalities. There are only a few different things that the skin can do. The hair can fall out. There can be little masses, there can be rashes, and then the the basic development and progression of the rashes is a clue. So the whole thing is trying to kind of tease out the little subtle differences that will distinguish one problem from another and do it in a way that is the least invasive and the least traumatic and in a way that works best for the individual family. So that's, okay, that's doctor, where the... Doc Dr. Stoking, I'm sorry. Can you try now and see if you can share your screen? Looks good. Looks good. All right. <laughs> now I'm going to go to slideshow. Start from beginning. Okay. All right. So that is us today. Veterinary dermatology, best job in the world. Skin is the largest and the most important organ in the body, and any of you who know Keith Richter uh, know that um, I constantly told him that because all of the stuff that he would work with is so much less important than the skin. The skin is readily accessible. We can see it. We can touch it. We can treat it directly. And as I said, there's a similar presentation for a myriad of different disorders, so it winds up being a good um, investigative puzzle to try to figure out what the problems are. And many problems are chronic, and I get to treat all species. And this is one of my best friends in the world, my little horse spider, who also has allergies. The structure of the skin is fairly straightforward. There are several different layers. The top layer is this, called the stratum corneum, and then there are a bunch of other layers between that and the basal layer. The skin basically forms from the basal layer up. The top of it is basic, what we call corneocytes, and they act as bricks with a lipid protein mortar in between them, and that causes an epidermal barrier, the job of which is to keep the inside in and the outside out, basically protect against water loss, protect against pathogen entry, and maintain homeostasis. What damages the barrier? There can be structural and biochemical changes that occur as the skin develops. So instead of having what we call differentiation, a normal process of development of the upper layer of the skin cells from the bottom layer, there can be genetic problems in how those cells mature that lead to major problems. There can be inflammatory problems like a lot of times associated with allergy. There can be nutritional deficits that cause problems. And then dysfunction with the immune system, either autoimmune or allergic or problems with a decrease in the local immunity at the skin. Also, there can be trauma, frequently secondary to pruritus, which is a fancy word for itch, or infection or any type of trauma like injections or surgery. So the dermatologic problems that we deal with range from autoimmune diseases, endocrine, hormonal abnormalities, nutritional imbalances, imbalances neoplasia or cancer. Uh, dogs, cats, and horses do get various types of skin cancers. And then there are other cancers that may metastasize to the skin or may produce changes in the skin that can be a clue to, to suspecting an internal neoplasia. 
There are all kinds of different parasites that can cause problems on the skin, bacterial, fungal, or viral infections, and most commonly, allergies. So this is just an example. These are a variety of different patients, all of whom have problems with their nose, muzzle, some around the eyes. But every single one of these pictures is a completely different process. This patient has or had squamous cell carcinoma, which melanocytes that affect the eyes, leading to uh, problems uh, that can cause a lot of pain, and then also causes destruction of the skin, primarily on the face. This collie cross has something called discoid lupus erythematosus, which is an immune system attack near the base of the skin cell layer. This patient has something called pemphigus exfoliaceus, which is when the immune system attacks the molecules that hold skin cells together kind of in the middle of that skin layer. This dog down here was digging around in rodent burrows and got a fungal infection, a type of dermatophyte or ringworm. So this, this dog down here has a fungal infection all over his face. This poor little lady that I just loved uh, developed uh, cutaneous lymphoma. So her nose is affected because there are cancer cells in there. And this sweet little dog has a problem absorbing and metabolizing zinc. So these problems were because of nutritional issues. So how do we tell all these, these things apart? Basically, it is a detective story. Uh, there are some breeds that are predisposed to certain things. Collies, Australian Shepherds are predisposed to a lot of immune, autoimmune diseases. Age plays a role. Some diseases don't occur until later in life. Some of the diseases are more likely to occur in males or females. The history is really a critical part of the whole picture, and that's where it it's important to listen to what the patient's parents have to say about what the problem was when it first started. What did it look like? What impressions did the parent have? And then how did those clinical signs change over time? And a lot of times people may not really think about things at the first visit that might be important, but they may think of something later. And I encourage anything that could help us have a little bit more understanding about the history of development of the, of the problem. Then there are some subtle differences in patterns that we see. Uh, if there's hair loss, is the hair loss associated with redness and inflammation? Or is the area around where the hair was lost uh, very calm in appearance? Uh, does the hair get lost over the trunk? over the paws or over the face. If there are rashes, was it what we call a rash first that then started itching, or was it itchy first and then developed a rash? And is there anything else that's going on? Like with the, the patient with uveo dermatologic syndrome, it was important to, to note that the dog had also been to an ophthalmologist. So putting together some of the other signs that may affect other, other body systems, we can kind of narrow down our focus. And then there are a lot of diagnostic tests that we do. Basic blood work is really important to get clues, also to have a, a baseline so we can see how things may change over time. It also helps us determine how most safely to treat the patient. And then to interpret blood work, it's really important to have a urinalysis as well, because if the urine is really concentrated, then sometimes the parameters in the blood that we're looking at can be elevated, not because there are problems with any of the organs, but just because the patient may be a little bit dehydrated. One of the things that I do constantly is take samples of the surface of the skin 
and look at it under the microscope. Microscope. Right there. That is the microscope, which, oh, well, I'm not very good at photography. The microscope is the tool that I use the most because then I can get a microscopic idea of what's going on on the surface of the skin that I can then basically basically coordinate with my impressions of what I see grossly so I can get a microscopic and a macroscopic view. And with the cytology, I can see what types of cells are present from the immune system. So if there's an immune attack, what immune system cells are playing a role I can see if there are bacteria or malassezia yeast. Sometimes I can see if there may be cells that I think are cancerous or cells that might be directly associated with what we see with autoimmune disease. With skin scrapings, I can get deeper samples for cytology, and I can also look for mites. Histopathology is when we get a punch biopsy and get a sample, a core sample of the skin layers. And then we send that to a pathologist that specializes in skin and that pathologist looks at patterns of inflammation or lack of inflammation, the presence or absence of any organisms and any changes in the skin cells. So histopathology, although it doesn't guarantee a diagnosis, if we're doing it appropriately and we've selected the correct site and made sure that there's not going to be anything else going on with the skin that's going to hide the information, it gives us the best chance at getting the most evidence so we can then put everything together and come up with our best diagnosis and treatment plan. If I'm suspicious of an organism or resistant, say I'm suspicious that a pet may have a methicillin resistant staph, then we need to get a culture, and with that, the pathologist or the microbiologist will grow the sample and figure out exactly what organisms are there, and then what antibiotics will work to fix, basically get rid of that organism. And then we can also test for dermatophytes, ringworm, like trichophyton or microsporum, and we use a different type of culture for that. So those are basically the tools of the trade. Oops. All right, so kind of touched a little bit on autoimmune diseases, pemphigus foliaceus. Pemphigus foliaceus is something that has a tendency to act the same in most species. So the places that you'll see lesions of pemphigus foliaceus can be pretty much the same in dogs, cats, and also other species like goats and, and horses can have pemphigus foliaceus, and it'll look pretty similar. Uh, this is the uh, Akita with uveodermatologic syndrome. Um, uveodermatologic syndrome occurs in dogs and also in humans, where it's called something different, but it's basically the same thing. Discoid lupus erythematosus is much more common, fortunately, than systemic lupus in dogs. Systemic lupus is uh, something that affects uh, several different body organs, and it's something that if, you know, I diagnose lupus in a dog, I always want to make sure that the owner is aware that it's not the lupus that they think about when they think about lupus in people. Dogs can get that, but it's not very common. And then there are endocrine hormonal diseases, the most common ones in dogs, hypothyroidism. And the thyroid hormone has a lot of effects on the local immunity in the skin and also directly on the hair follicles and pigmentation. So this dog was diabetic as well as hypothyroid, but the hair was lost primarily on the chest and the trunk and because of the decreased immune function at the level of the skin, the dog tended to get horrible infections, yeast infections and bacterial infections. Dogs and cats both get hyperadrenocorticism, which is also called um, Cushing's disease. It's much more common in dogs than it is in cats. In both, both species, they can have a lot of hair loss, uh, they will be more susceptible to secondary infections, 
um, my little dog behind me had an atypical form of Cushing's that um, we didn't really know about because all of his blood tests were normal. But in the process of treating uh, kidney cancer, Dr. Aiken removed his kidney, and one of his adrenal gland had a mass on it, so he removed that too. And then my little dog's hair started growing back much, much better. So the most common form we can diagnose with blood tests, but there are some atypical forms that are a little bit harder to manage. With cats, hyperadrenocorticism or Cushing's is much more rare. One of the things that will happen with cats that have Cushing's, though, is that their skin can be some it can become so fragile that if someone were to try to to scruff the cat or hold the cat uh, and the cat decided to leave, then the basically the the skin and the fur could come off. So that's something with all of my feline patients. I'm always very careful not to not to do anything a little bit rough. I couldn't do anything rough anyway. I'm too much of an animal lover. But even just gentle routine care in cats that have Cushing's can lead to, to problems with the skin tearing. The good thing is that once the Cushing's under control, the skin heals and the cat's fine. So these are examples of skin cancers that are associated with ultraviolet light. And a lot of dogs can get something called hemangioma or sometimes hemangiosarcoma in the And they can be problematic because they can easily bleed, and it's best to get rid of them when they're they're very small. They're present because of solar exposure. So just like we might start developing problems because of solar exposure that we had in our misspent youth, even once you stop the exposure to the sun in these these patients there still may be problems that develop. And we have several patients that come in two or three times a year, and we just get rid of all of the little tumors that we see. Uh, the ones that are larger that we can't necessarily get rid of, we'll use the carbon dioxide laser. The larger ones will biopsy, and sometimes they do have to go to surgery. And just like in people, the areas that are exposed to the sun are the areas that are most likely to get the UV light associated tumors. So usually we'll see these on lightly pigmented pets that like to sunbathe. Cats can get squamous cell carcinoma and usually we see that in light, lightly pigmented or white haired cats. And some of the most common places that we'll see that on cats are the nose, the tips of the ears, uh, and sometimes around the eyes, the eyelids. And these are things that are treatable if caught quickly. The photo on the bottom, this one, is a dog that had fairly extensive squamous cell car carcinoma on the abdomen from sunbathing and also this particular patient also had some of the hemangiomas as well. There are some unusual types and not so common types. Cutaneous lymphoma is something that can look like anything. And on this little lady, it looks like some of the things that we see on the nose. But it absolutely can look like anything. And it can just look like red skin or scale. But the red skin isn't quite the same texture or color as the red skin that we'll see associated with allergy. And the scale is locally thick and not like the scale that we'll usually see with some of the other problems that we call disorders of keratinization that lead to scale as well. Then one thing that's kind of unusual, there's a syndrome in cats that's it's called a perineoplastic syndrome, which means that it's something that goes along with having cancer. Cats that have pancreatic cancer, for some reason, will lose their hair and develop shiny skin, primarily on the ventral abdomen. And sometimes they'll come in to us for hair loss because people will think that they have an allergy and we check and there may be a, a mild infection. And then we recommend an abdominal ultrasound to see if there is neoplasia. So going to things that are a little bit um, 
more common, unfortunately, a lot of what we do is associated with ectoparasites. The most important ones in dermatology are fleas, various mites, and mosquitoes. Ticks cause a lot of diseases, but not so many diseases that have dermatologic manifestations. Exposure to the ectoparasites can, the re reaction to the exposure can vary dramatically between individual patients depending on how hypersensitive they are to the saliva of the ectoparasite or the presence of antigens in the ectoparasite. So this is a lovely electron microscope photograph of a flea. Here we have a little mite, and that's an ododectes mite. Then we have a mis mite. So demodex mites, there are several different species. Demodex mites are host specific, which means that they can't go from one type of animal to another. And demodex mites aren't even shared between individual members of the same species except at birth. Demodex mites, various different species are present in all mammals, and they're passed from the mother to the offspring around the time of birth and nursing. Sarcoptes mites are basically scabies mites. It's Sarcoptes, scabii, var, canis in dogs, and notoedres in cats. And Sarcoptes mites are contagious, but they can, they're also host specific in that they cannot complete their life cycle and reproduce except on their host. So notoedres mites are cat mice, and although they could jump off and irritate a dog or a person, they're not going to be able to survive on that person for very long. Ododexes over here are ear mites, and um, they primarily affect the ears. Uh, but they can also move over to the skin and affect, usually it'll be the, the tail, the paws, or the areas around the ears. We have a lot of treatments for mites recently that we didn't used to have. We used to have to use ivermectin to treat the mites, and ivermectin at the doses that we had to use to kill mites was toxic, could, or potentially toxic to dogs. So then a type of flea treatment became licensed, starting, starting with, um, I forget, I think it was Brevecto that was the first one, but the class that can, includes Brevecto, Nexgard, Semperica, and Credilio all kill mites, and they're very, very safe and very effective. So we have a, it's pretty easy to treat them these days. Sarcoptes mites, this little dog has Sarcoptes mites. They are very, very itchy in patients that have a hypersensitivity reaction to them. They usually like to be on the cooler areas of the body. So we'll see them on the ears, the elbows, the hocks, but they can become generalized. And this is one that people can pick up from their dog, but it won't survive. It won't be able to complete a life cycle and reproduce, but it would mean a miserable two to three weeks. Ododectes, ear mites, primarily ears, like I said, people can only get them if they try. There's a story that sounds like an urban legend, but it's actually true, where a veterinarian several years ago wanted to know what ear, likes were, ear mites were like and put ear mites in his own ears. So that was a dermatology legend that as a resident I said, well, I'm not that dedicated, I'm never doing that. But um, again, cannot complete the life cycle. Dogs and cats can both get them, but we usually will see them in cats. Demodex can cause extreme discomfort because it's so specific, people can't get it. This lives deep in the hair follicles, so it can cause really nasty secondary infections. Used to be very, very hard to treat. Now it's very easy to treat with uh, things like um, Semperica, Brevecto, et cetera. The biggest problem uh, that we see is that there are some breeds that are profoundly genetically predisposed to getting demodex, and those dogs can suffer greatly. I've had patients come in on gurneys because they're in so much pain they can't walk. And it's just delightful when I then do a skin scraping and find demodex mites. It's like, yay, we can fix this and your dog's going to be fine. 
Mosquitoes are not usually a problem in dogs and cats because of their hair, but some cats are very allergic to mosquito bites and will get a mosquito bite hypersensitivity that primarily affects their nose. Fleas are the biggest issue. Uh, there are two different sets of problems that we can have with flea bites. We can have a flea bite dermatitis where there's just a little bump where the fleas have bitten, and that can occur in dogs, cats, and humans. But some individuals can be profoundly hypersensitive to the flea saliva and then get an allergic dermatitis from the fleas. We have trouble with fleas because we live in such a lovely area. We have the perfect um, temperature range, the perfect amount of sunlight, perfect relative humidity, and there are lots of little animals that fleas like. Fleas prefer cats, dogs second best, but they also love opossums, and they can be carried by squirrels, birds, so they are just incredibly prevalent in San Diego County. The other thing that we can get besides parasites, various and sundry different types of bacteria, I kind of alluded to, uh, epidermal barrier defects, especially in dogs, can lead to problems with overgrowths of bacteria. The most common overgrowth we see in dogs is of a bacteria called Staphylococcus sued intermedius. And that organism is host adapted to dogs, doesn't really like to be on people. The most common or the most common bacteria that's associated with infections on human skin that people are concerned about is Staphylococcus aureus. That can develop resistance to a lot of antibiotics and is then referred to as MRSA, methicillin resistant staph. That does not grow very well on dogs. It's host adapted to people. So dogs have a hard time getting it. And if they do get it, it doesn't cause them as many problems as it causes in people. The good thing is that it's not that easy for people to pick up an infection from their dog. And it's not that easy for dogs to pick up an infection from their people because of the host adaptations of the bacteria. And then anything that decreases the immune system, like hypothyroidism or anything that breaks the barrier is also going to lead to a increased predisposition to infection. We don't see very many viral manifestations except papillomavirus, the, with the true warts in dogs, and those are usually self-limiting. That's something that dogs' immune systems can take care of. Cats can get an atypical type of virus that can then lead to something that is a precancerous condition that has kind of a, a very specific uh, manifestation. That's something that I've seen a handful of times. It's not very common. There are a lot of different fungal diseases. Uh, malassezia, which is a type of yeast that we see in dogs with allergies a lot because of biochemical changes in the epidermal barrier. It's not like the yeast that, it's not candida, it's not the yeast that people will sometimes get in association with antibiotic therapy or something like that. Um, but some people do have a type of malassezia. Malassezia in humans has been associated with dandruff and it, it can be very, very itchy. Then dermatophytes. This one's the malassezia dog. Uh, dermatophytes, we think about ringworm, kitty ringworm, um, but dogs can get a variety of different types as well that can look like a lot of different things. Uh, frequently, dogs will get them from the soil and um, from digging. Ringworm dermatophytosis is not necessarily contagious to people. The one that a lot of cats like to get, which is actually called microsporin canis, so it's a cat adapted ringworm named for dogs, but um, that one is contagious to dogs and to people, uh, but also depending on an individual's susceptibility. There are also, this, this particular dog turned out to have something called Microsporum gypsium, which is found from digging and it's a soil organism. And then the one that I showed earlier in the, the lecture was trichophyton, which is from digging, digging around in rodent burrows. There are some very deep fungal infections that can cause problems. We don't see them very often in California. Uh, there's the one that we see most often here is called Cryptococcus, 
and that'll sometimes affect cats in the nose. Uh, but in other parts of the country where I did my residency, we had things like blastomycosis and histoplasmosis, and those could be pretty pretty severe and require consultation with internal medicine. The most common reason dogs and cats see a dermatologist, though, is because they have allergies. And the most common breed of dog to have aller, or I shouldn't say the most common because they're not as popular, but the dog that has the greatest probability when you take into account kind of normalized for the, the population, West Highland Whites are about 13 times more likely than any other breed to develop allergies, which is why there's one sleeping behind me on my chair. So allergies are mostly characterized by pruritus, which is itch, and basically that definition is a sensation that provokes a desire to scratch. And in dogs and cats, it's not just scratching, it's also chewing, biting, licking, or rubbing. And depending on the individual patient and where the itch happens to be, uh, you may see not very much scratching, but a lot of licking. Cats groom themselves normally, and it can be really difficult to determine whether or not a cat is over-grooming. But dogs don't groom themselves. So dogs that come in from outside and kind of lick their paws, they most likely have some type of allergy because the, the cells that can trigger allergic reactions are very common in the paws of, of dogs. Mast cells are present at an increased density in those areas, in dogs and in humans. Other signs of canine, of canine allergy, because here's where cats and dogs differ a bit. Other signs of canine allergy besides itching, hair loss. Cats can get hair loss too, but dogs will frequently develop an odor, and the odor is because of problems with the biochemistry, with the oils in the skin. And the odor usually reflects oxidation, rancidization of fats that are being metabolized by bacteria and yeast. So there are also changes in color and texture of the skin. If there's a lot of inflammation, the skin will turn dark, and that's something called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So a lot of times where there's been an infection or even where the, the hair is just shorter, uh, either because the dog's been licking it or sometimes because someone's shaved for a catheter or something, there can be changes in color and texture of the skin that, that are associated with the inflammation and the allergy. And then in dogs, recurrent infections of the skin and also of the ears. Allergy is basically a hypersensitivity. So allergy occurs because the immune system is being exposed to something that it should ignore. So the immune system is being exposed to a protein, either a protein in say flea saliva, a mosquito saliva, a protein in the diet or an environmental allergen that it should not be paying any attention to, but it thinks it's a pathogen and it thinks it needs to attack and destroy it effectively. And, and it seems that in humans, dogs, and most likely also in cats, there's a genetic predisposition to hyper-reacting that depending on environmental epigenetic phenomena may or may not get turned on. But certain individuals have a tendency to, for their immune systems to basically go haywire. I'm one of them. I was allergic to every animal I was tested to before I decided to be a vet. And then I started developing allergies to um, shrimp and lobster. And then I developed allergies to medications and then to metals because my immune system goes crazy. And the little dog behind me is allergic, very, very allergic to food, um, has previously been allergic to things in the environment after years and years of desensitization that worked. He's not as allergic to environmental allergens and he's also very allergic to flea saliva. So 
we can't think of an individual as just having a flea allergy or just being food allergic or just being allergic to things in the environment. We have to realize that each individual that has that kind of hyperreactive immune system could potentially be allergic to all of those things. So as we try to determine what the, the patient is allergic to, we have to be very careful about following an algorithm to sort out and rule out and continue to maintain uh, that, that rule out um, for all of the different allergies. For example, because fleas are so common, we need to prevent exposure to flea saliva if we want to then assess the, ex the response to exposure to a particular food or environment. So we have to be very careful and methodical in how we go about determining what the, the patient is allergic to. There's also a threshold effect. It's called the pruritic threshold. So this graph basically shows it's how much exposure to a particular environmental trigger or hypersensitivity trigger is going to aggravate the immune system. So flea allergy might be about 35%. Allergies to mold spores may be about 25%. And then dry skin, dry skin is itchy skin, um, maybe about 20%. If the mold count is high and the dog is exposed to flea saliva, you're going to go over that threshold and the dog's going to itch. If the skin is dry, move the flea allergy, though, the dog's not going to show any signs of itch uh, or despite the presence of mold or the, or the dryness of the skin because you've kind of taken that away and then brought the pet under the threshold over which the immune system is so insulted the dog's going to scratch. So we want to control as many different things as we can to basically have the happiest pet that we can. So just a little bit on flea allergy, it's the saliva that they're allergic to. In dogs, if a flea, if a dog is primarily flea allergic, doesn't really have allergies to other things, the most common place we're going to see problems, and it's not 100%, but the most, the highest probability is that the signs are going to start, the itchiness is going to start around the back third of the body. And then depending on how the flea exposure uh, progresses, it can spread and encompass the whole body. But if a patient comes in and their paws are fine, their face is fine, their ears are fine, but they're just scratching around here and licking around their tummy, then we just make sure that the fleas are under control. And frequently, that's all we need to do, just manage the fleas and the pet's allergies are fine. The important thing with that is that fleas are the biggest source of allergy in both dogs and in cats, and a lot of pets are euthanized because of allergy, because people can't handle managing them, and they'll be adopted from a shelter and then returned to the shelter. One of my sweetest little cats had been returned to a shelter twice, and um, it was just because of her allergies. And then I have another little cat that was up for euthanasia at the shelter, and because his allergies were so bad, and he had, there were other problems, but he was too sweet, so they couldn't euthanize him. So I got the little email, please adopt him, so I did. Um, but a lot of animals will be euthanized just because they have allergies, and there's so much that we can do to help them. Now, more than there has been in the past as well. But a lot of it is education to help pet parents know what, what can be done so they don't just give up and say, oh, I can't manage this anymore. Exposure, it's the flea salivary antigen, a funny, interesting point in cats, also in dogs. You cannot rule fleas out by flea combing, and you are more likely to find fleas in a cat that is not allergic than to find fleas in a cat that is allergic, because allergic cats are more likely to groom the flea away. If you see fleas, you've probably got an infestation, but 
just by being in our perfect flea environment, there's always going to be some exposure. Treatment failures, usually it's because there's a really high population of fleas. Sometimes it can be because the wrong product was used. Um, there are so many different products available right now, though, that talk to your vet. There's going to be something that's going to work for a particular family situation. Not every flea product is going to be appropriate for every family or every pet. So lots of options. The prescription options work the best. So talk to your vet. So for dogs, canine food allergy and environmental allergy can be tricky to distinguish. The clinical signs are exactly the same. So the location of the itch, the presence of infections, the way that things will look are exactly the same between dogs that are allergic to a protein in their diet and allergic to things in the environment. So they can get ear infections, they can get little infections in their armpits, their paws, problems around their face, their tummy. And because allergy has genetic links to destruction of the epidermal barrier and changes in the biochemistry, dogs are very likely to get secondary bacterial and malassezia infections. The interesting thing is that aller food allergy and environmental allergy in dogs is highly analogous to that in humans. Everything from the sites, this is one of the, the flexural surfaces in the, the arms, are one of the biggest Places, one of the, the prime areas for atopic eczema in humans, uh, the face and the hands too for atopic eczema. So there are a lot of similarities between those two things, which had led to a lot of interesting um, research developments. And right now, it, the treatments that have been developed for dogs are actually for the what we call atopic dermatitis in dogs are better than the treatments for people with atopic eczema. And in the human side, they're trying to catch up to what, on the dermatology side, we figured out. I, smarter people than me figured out, but um, we benefited from that. Adverse reaction to food, food allergy, we're talking about the immunologic, which a true allergy is because of problems with the immune system. And with food allergy, you can have dermatologic signs or you can have tummy signs. Food intolerance is something a little bit different. Uh, we're not necessarily going to talk about that. But um, what I'm focusing on and what we usually see the most common ones are allergies to, to proteins in the diet. They can look exactly the same as environmental allergies, but we also may have problems with diarrhea, weight loss, vomiting, gastrointestinal signs as well. So not all dogs with food allergy do have gastrointestinal signs, but it's one of those little clues that can help us rule that out. So food allergens, they have to be a protein or a glycoprotein, and that's because the way that the immune system is notified that there is an invader is with an antibody, and the only nutritional items that have a different enough structure that an antibody can be developed to recognize it are proteins. And they have to be big enough uh, so that they don't slip under the immune system's radar. They have to be stable through processing, digestion, and it can either be plant protein sources, uh, meat protein sources. They need to be immunogenic, which means they need to stimulate the immune system. But that's a little bit different in, in dogs and cats than in people, because in dogs and cats, we don't necessarily see individual proteins that are more or less likely to cause an allergic reaction. So it's not like in humans where shrimp and lobster or strawberries or things like that can trigger a reaction. It's basically anything that the patient has eaten for a, for a long period of time. 
So the only way to figure out what an, a pet is allergic to is to do a diet trial. So we basically feed the pet something that doesn't contain proteins that the immune system has been exposed to before, and that would either be a novel protein that isn't similar to a protein the dog ate before, or a source where the proteins are broken up into pieces that are too small, so they do fly under the radar. There are some serum tests that are available, but they don't work. Um, they have what's called a positive predictive value of 0 to 11% which means they're wrong 89 to 100% of the time. And then there are hair and saliva tests that really shouldn't be done because there's no scientific basis behind them. In order to make, in order to properly conduct the diet trial though, you also have to make sure that you're controlling barrier defects and any infections. So it can be a little tricky and we have food diaries and, and provide a lot of support to, to families when they're, they're going through this. So kind of talked about that. Um, sometimes people will want to cook a diet for themselves, and that's fine, but we do recommend consultation with a veterinary nutritionist because we don't want nutritional imbalances causing changes in the skin that then make it hard for us to interpret the results. The best diets for the diagnostic diet trial are the prescription diets because they are not um, they are, are not contaminated with other proteins and studies. Uh, other protein out. Um, there are a lot of different options though. Uh, novel protein diets, minimally processed diets, RAIN Clinical Nutrition makes minimal, min, uh, sorry, minimally processed whole food diets, hydrolyzed protein diets, and ultra hydrolyzed protein diets. Kind of talked about that. Then once we've completed the diet trial, which takes about 8 to 12 weeks, the best way to prove that the dog is allergic is to challenge with the previous diet in small quantities to see if we can recreate some of the clinical signs. I found that my patients will do their own challenges though sometimes and steal something that they're not supposed to have. And I always recommend that the parents just pay attention and note whether or not there is a flare if the, um, the pet has had a dietary indiscretion. Raw diets, although they're popular, the nutrition is not balanced. And unfortunately, there's no medical evidence that shows any benefit. But there are a lot of, of problems associated with the raw diets. Um, because of imbalanced nutrition, problems with the calcium phosphorus ratio that can sometimes cause weakening of the bones. They do have a lot of parasites. They tend to be very high in fat. Uh, the ones that have pieces of bones can cause perforations going through. And the infections include things like salmonella, the pathogenic E. coli that can be pretty serious and lead to the septicemia. So although it, it can sound nice to people that like to do things in a natural way, it can cause a lot of problems. So that's not something that, that we recommend. Fortunately though, there are a lot of options for people that won't want to use, don't want to use something that's ultra processed or a kibble. Just Food for Dogs has some really nice formulations and then the rank clinical nutrition. So there are options. It's not a go raw or go kibble. There are a lot of different things in between. Always good to have choices. Easiest to manage. Food allergy, all you have to do, like my dermatologist told me, okay, you're allergic to shrimp. What do you do? Don't eat shrimp. And it's the same thing for our, our pets. To manage food allergy, we just let them have the proteins that don't trigger the allergy and they'll do fine. Environmental allergies are tricky and they're, like I said before, they can look exactly like food allergy. We know a lot about environmental allergies in dogs. We know a lot about the pathophysiology and that's led to new treatments like Cytopoint and Apoquil. We don't know that in cats yet. 
one of the reasons we know so much more in dogs is because it is so similar to what we see in humans. So we kind of got a little bit of a head start, and the research that's done on the human side in the path of, into the pathophysiology and the genetics and the barrier defects, that all crosses over into the canine side. What we Dr. used Stoking? to think. Yeah? Dr. Stoking, I'm so sorry. This is Annie. Um, I, you hi, wanted me to let you know. Hi. I wanted to, uh, you wanted me to let you know when it's five and it is five o'clock. Um, okay. I just wanted to, to give you a heads up and I want to be very courteous of your time. So I just wanted to make sure we have enough time for questions too, but please continue speaking as well. Okay. That's, that's great. I can shorten this, fortunately. You used to think that allergies were inhaled. Um, now we know it's epidermal barrier defects that lead to them. Diagnosis of environmental allergies is a diagnosis of exclusion. We have to basically rule out all other causes of itch before coming up with a diagnosis of allergy to things in the environment, and then at that point, we can test to see what the pet is allergic to and then treat allergy desensitization. Kind of talked about that before. Uh, topical therapy, we can use a lot of different uh, shampoos, mousses, lotions, and creams to avoid medications. Feline allergy, this is the little one that um, was going to be euthanized. Feline allergy, we do not know as much about trying to learn it. Very different, different than dogs. Cats are not small dogs. They can have the same clinical signs, whether they're allergic to flea, food allergy, or environmental allergy. Uh, the diagnostic steps are the same, but we just don't know as much about why it happens, which gives us fewer management options. And then a little slide on where you can get more information about all of these different things. All right. So now we can open up for to questions. Okay. Awesome. Um, you are great. And thank you so much for, for your time. Um, that was very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Stoking. Um, we do have a few questions, so please uh, feel free to let me know um, because I know how busy you are. <laughs> so I want, so if, if we're not able, and just to let all the participants know, if we're not able to get to all of your questions, I will follow up with Dr. Stoking and, and we'll get them answered, okay? Um, so I always have trouble with this word and I apologize, um, but one of the questions is, um, you did talk a little bit about, oh, here I go, hemangiosarcoma. <laughs> And your sarcoma. Uh, yes. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah. there was just a, it was just a question. She has a number of dogs. Three of them are unrelated, but they have the same lesions on their pelvis around the same time. Um, she was just curious about that. So there are a couple of different types. There's the cutaneous hemangioma. The hemangioma means it's benign. Hemangiosarcoma would mean that it was malignant. The hemangiomas that are benign are usually start out pretty small. The, the hemangiosarcomas can be more deeply invasive. And we can see them on unrelated dogs if their environmental history is similar. So if they're unrelated but they're, they have short hair and pale skin and they like to sunbathe, then it wouldn't be surprising to see problems on both of the dogs. The hemangiosarcomas, there's another type of hemangiosarcoma that is a, tu a tumor of internal blood vessels, and that's much more serious, and that's where they, there can be tumors in the spleen, tumors in the liver, and that's a much more a serious type of cancer than the hem hemangiosarcoma hemangiomas that we see on the skin. Hemangiosarcomas from the skin do not usually metastasize to the internal organs, 
but we do usually recommend a complete surgical removal of those. Those are more difficult to manage just with the carbon dioxide laser. So I hope I answered the question. Okay. Um, and Dr. Stoking, can you um, unshare your screen so we can see you while you're answering the question? Oh, stop share. Okay. Okay. Hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, just a couple more. Um, can you just ask about, or I'm sorry, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, it's the summertime and so a lot of uh, beachgoers right now. Um, can you uh, talk about any kind of SPF products that you would suggest? Um, when animals are spending quite a bit of time outside, beach, park, et, et cetera? Well, just like in people, the best way, the best prevention is covering up. So SPF products, there are actually several available for dogs. Um, one water baby stick is good for noses. You have to be careful about zinc toxicity. So you have you want to use something that's basically safe if it's ingested. Um, the other thing, there's something called um, My Pet Sunblock that is something you can get online that's a kind of aluminum oxide and zinc oxide powder, but is safe. Uh, then there are several online that. There are a few new ones. I can't remember the names right now, but there are a few online that are very effective and helpful. And then there's also a Neutrogena product that is uh, basically a, has some good water protection and is safe for infants. Um, basically, the thing to do is just to make sure that none of the ingredients are toxic to dogs. But really, the biggest problem with tend more protection than they actually do. And because of that, people can have a false sense of security when what you really need to be doing is being careful about how you get the exposure to the sun. So if you're going to be at the beach with your dog, do it in the morning or in the evening. It's also safer to prevent um, heat exhaustion. Uh, but Try to prevent exposure during what the hours with the highest ultraviolet index. So there are some sun suits. There's a company in Australia that makes some sun suits that can prevent exposure to the sun as well. Okay. Um, and I'm getting a lot of comments from people who are just very grateful for you and everything that that you're doing. So, um, just wanted to pass that on to you as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you very can you much. <laughs> can you also talk a little bit about um, what is a, a comedone and what when oh, when okay. do they need to be uh, treated? So, comedone basically is just a plugged a follicle, a hair follicle, that's plugged with keratin, which is a protein that's made as a byproduct of that um, epidermal differentiation. And there are certain breeds that tend to get comedones more than others. Schnauzers like to get them along their back. Uh, Chinese Crested's will get comedones um, that can sometimes become very large and become get secondary infections. The same thing with sh with schnauzers. Other comedomes, we want to make sure that if it's not a breed where we genetically expect to see the comedomes, we need to determine why those are there because sometimes they can be a sign that the dog has Cushing. But for the breeds that can get them, because it is a genetic thing that we tend to expect in that breed, I usually only worry about them if it looks like they're getting large and uncomfortable or developing a secondary infection. 
Okay. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, there's a lot of information um, regarding CBD treatments, essential oils for allergies. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, ensuring uh, that the vet is using empirical and evidence-based treatments? That, and for that, you do have to be very careful. There's not that much information on CBD treatments in dogs. There, and that's because of the difficulties in getting clinical trials uh, approved for CBD treatment. There was some work in humans where it looked like some of the CBD receptors were also associated with triggering itch. So there was some suspicion in humans that there might be a role. But nothing, I haven't really seen anything come out of that. So I think it's an area where we might learn something down the road. It's definitely not something that I want to just dismiss, um, mm -hmm. but I just don't know at this point. We don't have the evidence yet, which is a problem. With essential oils, you have to be careful because some of the essential oils contain things that can be toxic to dogs. You have to be really careful. Um, a lot of the essential oils can potentially contain things that can cause liver problems. They have um, ingredients something called a sesquiterpene that can be problematic for the liver. There are some essential oil products that are available that have gone through clinical trials and testing. There's a company called Dermascent that's based in France that has several that where when you look at what the, the science behind the individual oils, you can see where the oils do, there's been evidence that shows that some of those oils can directly inhibit some of the inflammation. But then you have to take into account that even a human might put the oil on, but our pets, if we put the oil on, the pet's going to lick it off. So we have to make sure that we something that we, we use it exactly as the manufacturer recommends. Um, this French company, Dermacent, has something called um, Essential Fix, which works very, very well, but needs to be applied between the shoulder blades, and that's so that it can spread over the body in a non-toxic concentration, but you don't want to apply it, say, on a paw, where the whole thing can then just get licked up. So, you know, you can get things that have gone through testing and have clinical trial backing behind them, and the interesting thing, too, is that the companies that have done that are very, very happy to share the information. So usually if you go to the website and, you know, look at the, the website, they should have clinical trial data. You never want to trust anecdotes or testimonials. You know, if I see a website investigating a product and all the evidence they have is testimonial evidence, then that tells me that the people that are making that product don't understand the scientific method very well, so I can't really trust what they say. But if you have someone that's done a study and had it and gotten that study peer reviewed, then you can be much more comfortable with accepting what they say. So there's actual mm -hmm. evidence. Testimonial is an evidence. Okay. Um, so you, you were talking a little bit about uh, minimizing UV radiation exposure for pets. Um, but here's a question regarding um, to decrease the risk of neoplasm. Okay. Just in general, to decrease the risk of cancer in general, is that the question? Um, let me go ahead and just read it. Re what recommendations do you have for minimizing UV radiation exposure for pets? to decrease okay. the risk of neoplasm. Okay, that's okay. So avoid this, avoid what in the 80s when I was a graduate student in oceanography hanging out in La Jolla and the Scripps Pier, <laughs> what I used to call the peak tanning hours. Mm. Don't, have your, don't have your pet out during the tanning hours. So, so that's the big thing. Walks in the morning, walks in the evening. Try to provide a shady, shady space. So try to discourage the pet from being outside when between, say, 10 in the morning and, gosh, probably 4, 
or five in the afternoon. And just some that some of that common sense. And like I said, that can also help prevent the risk of excess heat, heat stress or heat stroke. So you know, you have to be real careful when it's warm and humid because some of our pets, uh, they're, they're so dedicated to us, they may not always tell us how tired they might be getting and mm -hmm. we don't want to push too hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so here's an, another, can I just say for all of our participants, I love the questions. They're just, they're so insightful and um, I, I just love the questions that we received from the people who attend our, our webinars. So not only thank you to Dr. Stoking, but thank you for everybody who's attending as well. Um, but let me go ahead and get you this one. It says, can vegan diets be helpful for allergies? They're not necessarily vegan because vegan, because vegan diets don't support the whole nutritional requirements of, of dogs or cats. So you have to be real careful. Uh, some vegan diets have been associated with some serious problems in dogs and cats, but there are some diets that are vegetarian diets that are sufficiently balanced by, it has to be by a board certified veterinary nutritionist, somebody that knows all the ins and outs. Balancing a diet is not just looking at the ingredients and saying, oh, well, this ingredient sounds good. It has some things that are antioxidant or it has a mix of different oils. What you have to think about is what happens when that ingredient is eaten by a dog or by a cat. So what goes into the mouth is not necessarily what goes into the body because of the different ways that things are digested and then the different ways that things are absorbed. So a veterinary nutritionist, it's a three-year residency after vet school, after an in internship, then a two- to three-year residency, so, you know, seven to eight years of medical education just to be able to do a recipe. And that's because they take into account not the ingredients, but the nutrients. So what happens when that ingredient is broken down in a dog at the biochemical level? So not just looking at the, the meat, but saying, okay, if I process the meat in this way, what amino acids are going to be absorbed by the dog? And if that amino acid is mixed with this carbohydrate, what is going to happen? That one of the problems that it doesn't really have anything to do with dermatology except that I do make nutritional recommendations, so I'm highly aware of it, but the problem with the grain-free diets that are now being shown to cause dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure and death in dogs, and the folks at Davis and at Tufts and at a cardiology practice back east are working on trying to figure out why that happens, and it looks like there's some type of interaction between some ingredients in legumes like um, lentils, peas, chickpeas, um, that then may be blocking the absorption of certain amino acids. So all of the nutrients going in may look good on paper, but then what actually happens is that they can interact with each other and then lead to some pretty serious nutritional deficits. So that's the, that's the reason that it is important to get a diet formulated by a veterinary nutritionist. And if you get that recipe by a veterinary nutritionist, you need to follow that recipe precisely. So UC Davis has nutritionists, Tufts, Kansas State, North Carolina, and then there's a company called Balance It, too, that's online that was started by some nutritionists that used to be at Davis. And they will say specifically, for example, canola oil. And they mean canola oil because they know all of the different biochemical, you know, at the, at the organic and biochemical level, all of the different things that are present in canola oil. And you cannot then substitute olive oil because olive oil has a bunch of other different things. So if they say canola oil, you can't substitute. 
and if they say one specific type of vitamin or mineral supplement, you can't substitute. But people that have the, the patience and the dedication to do those diets and follow the recipe can be really successful. Um, but it's hard. And um, we have so many more options now, too, fortunately, like I was saying, with companies that understand that not everybody wants to feed kibble. Um, my dogs eat kibble, but not everybody's dog will, dogs will eat kibble, and not everybody wants to feed their dogs that. So there are enough different ways that you can get a diet that's safe. But um, there are some some options, and it's it's difficult though. And I I would not basically recommend trying to make your dog or cat into a vegan, just because their their requirements, their nutritional requirements, are so different. Okay, thank you, Dr. Stoking. Um, how much more time do you have for questions? I just want to make sure we're not. No, I'm okay. Your... I'll let you know. I'll, okay. I'll let you know. Okay. I'd like to answer as many as I can. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so you're going to have to help me out with these, okay? I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, a couple big words here that I'm going to try to pass on to you. Um, so the, one of the questions is regarding a German Shepherd. With a condition okay. that presents as skin lesions primarily on the hips, hind legs, and tail, that can that has been called two different things: fistulous disease. Okay, is that correct? And yeah, oh, my goodness. Okay, and then um, frunculo. Oh my goodness gracious! Frunculosis. You are yeah. Frunculosis. <laughs> so frunculosis basically means that. Kind of going backwards a little bit. So you you look at a hair follicle. The hair follicle uh, can become infected, and that's something called folliculitis, bacterial, fungal, or demodex. If a bunch of, and I should have said inflamed or infected. If a bunch of hair follicles become inflamed or effective, infected, and then that inflammation coalesces, you get a great big boil, and that's called furunculosis. And German shepherds do like to get furunculosis, but they also like to get fistulas. A fistula is a little different. A fistula is basically something that extends deep within the tissue. In German shepherds, we in German shepherds in the U.S., we will usually see that just around the perianal area, so it's called perianal fistulas. But in Europe, there are German shepherd lines that have fistulas that can occur between the toes or on the rear legs or in some cases almost any anywhere. But it's a, it's a kind of a different origin because the frunculosis is from something that has coalesced a bunch of hair follicles and ruptured. And the fistula is where there's basically a draining tract that goes deep into the skin. And that's usually because of a type of autoimmune disorder, we think. So that's the difference. And both of them, you can have nasty secondary infections, and you won't necessarily be able to get everything under control until you get the infection under control. And then you can try to find anything else that might be contributing to the inflammation. Okay. Um, so we have another one, a small um, Maltese Bichon, who every spring and summer licks his paws and Dewclaw pad a lot. Um, he has no skin irritations, no redness, no scratching. Um, to the point, didn't work, and he has never had fleas. Any suggestions? Okay. He probably does have allergies, and even if you've never seen fleas, fleas might be contributing uh, so still flea prevention is, is important just because of that pruritic threshold thing that I showed, because that's something that's easy. Um, he may have a mild infection that's hard to find, um, or he might just be, be itching there. Um, like I said, with people, the hands are one of the sites of atopic eczema. And in people with atopic eczema, they're more likely to get infections, but they don't necessarily always get them. So, so 
Cytopoint is an interesting thing. Cytopoint, in most dogs, Cytopoint will work after a single injection. In some dogs, Cytopoint works after a second injection, four weeks after the first. In a smaller group of dogs, we need to have three injections of Cytopoint one month apart before it, it kicks in. Um, and if a dog does not get better after three monthly injections of Cytopoint, then Cytopoint will not work for that dog. For this little Maltese, I would not want to do something that would be hard on the dog's system. So if we can control the itch with topical therapy, um, that would be ideal. If it's only spring and summer, and the dog eats the same food all year round, then it's probably not a food allergy. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Uh, what I worry about, though, is that there may be a little bit of malesthesia, the yeast organism, which can be really itchy, in the dog's nail beds or in between its toes or in the, in the bottom of the paws and between the pads. So that would be one of the things that I would look for. Um, the other thing is you could potentially try something a little bit different. It's kind of hard to say without seeing seeing a pet, but um, it's it sounds like an allergy to something in the environment, which could be exacerbated by exposure to flea saliva. But there are, there are things to do. This is not a patient where I would want to use some a big gun like prednisone, where we can have a lot of different bad side effects. But um, Apoquil can sometimes be very helpful, and Apoquil is is pretty darn safe. So there were some concerns about it when it first came out that have, after it's been out, now that it's been out for a while, people really aren't as, as concerned about it. Okay. So some things that could be done. Okay. Um, so just say a couple more. Um, this person writes that they have a schnoodle with a constant uh, cheering. Dark discharge from the eyes that leaves the fur rust colored. Uh, when they clean it off. He also gets the rust coloring around his mouth and between his paws. Is this an allergy? And if so, how can it be treated? So the dark rusty discoloration is called porphyrin. And and then so with poodles, there are eye problems that can cause excess tearing. So I tend to work real closely with our ophthalmologist because there are some times where it can be hard to see if the problems are because of an allergy or because of a structural problem with the eye. The fact that the paws are also rust colored, that can happen either because the dog is licking, licking his paws uh, or if he tends to, if there's any drooling or anything, if he tends to lie with his mouth on his paws, because that, the discoloration shows excess tearing. It's because of the excess tearing around the eyes, and then it's also because of saliva around the mouth and on the paws, and it certainly could be allergy. So what we would do, how we would approach that patient would be get a really, really thorough history and check to see if there are secondary infections, see if there's any damage to the skin. And then for the excess tearing, if I didn't find infection, and if I did find infection, if that didn't respond or resolve after I started treating for allergies and the infection, then I would want an ophthalmologist to take a peek. Poodles can have some genetic issues with their eyes, so I would probably, I would probably see if I could get the ophthalmologist to take a peek sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, so here is our final question: um, Can there be any issues uh, with grooming and the dog's dermatology? For example, a uh, dog with using grooming your dog with clippers or any other kind of tools that might impact their, their skin? Now that it's harder to get our dogs into professional groomer, a lot of people are trying to groom their dogs themselves, myself included, and I'm not a professional groomer. You want to make sure that if you're using clippers, 
um, you use them correctly, you don't want to go ag against the direction of, of hair growth. Uh, so there are problems with creating trauma if amateurs like me try to do grooming. If you go to a professional groomer, most groomers do a good job and know what they're doing. And a lot of times I'll have um, the groomer help with help me in caring for the, the dog, uh, either by trimming excess hair around the mouth or doing a poodle cut on a dog that tends to get a lot of infections. Uh, so what I like to do is try to use the groomers as part of the team and let the groomers know how we would want to use their skills in helping the patient going forward. There, the only real problem is that there are some instances where a dog will go to a groomer and then develop a bacterial infection afterwards. I have not seen that happen very often in San Diego. Um, the same type of infection can occur with dogs that just have mild trauma and exposure to water uh, that may carry a bacteria called Pseudomonas. Most of the groomers in San Diego do a really good job, so what I try to do is incorporate the groomer in, into the team. So we also have um, a variety of different medicated shampoos depending on what the problem is problem is, and then there's some hydrotherapy things that can be done to help the pet as well. Okay. So, Dr. Stoking, again, we just really want to thank you for, for joining us today. Um, we're still getting messages in thanking you and, and the great job that, that you do. Um, again, I want to thank all of our participants. I'm always so impressed with the the questions that people have, and, and we do appreciate it. Um, there is going to be an email that goes out um, with the, a link to the recording um, along with a survey. So we would love for people to fill out the survey as well. Uh, if there were any questions that I, that I missed, I really apologize. I tried to get to all of them, but please feel free to email me. We can keep the conversation going. Um, my email address is admin, A-D-M-I-N, at space, the number four, pets.org. And you should be receiving um, some more information about upcoming discussions we have. Uh, we have a monthly educational series. And just one last thing before we let you go, Dr. Stoking, we want to let everybody know that coming up this September is our 10th annual Bags and Bobbles event, and it's going virtual. And I can't tell you how much I love <laughs> the online auction. They are so much fun. So you can get more information on our website at space, the number four, pets.org, or you can email events at space for pets.org. So thank you again, Dr. Stoking. Um, thank you, everybody. We know how busy you are, Doctor, and we really appreciate the time you took welcome. in educating us today. Very welcome. You are very welcome. Anything that I can do to help, but understanding is the first step towards fixing. So thank you for Great. the opportunity. Well, thank you, and thank you, everybody, and we will see you next time. Thanks. All righty. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.